Um, uh, yeah. well, great, greetings if you're watching. Uh, welcome in today. Uh, I'm joined by uh, Steve August. We're going to be talking uh, about shortness of breath. And if you've watched my previous videos, then uh, you know it's a topic that uh, close to me uh, and something I've been dealing with since about March of uh, 2020. Um, at any rate, uh, specifically today, looking to talk about shortness of breath uh, and explore uh, the connection with a condition called uh, costochondritis. Now, uh, before we get going, uh, a disclaimer would be that uh, providing this video for educational purposes only, uh, it's always uh, in your best interest to go and talk about your condition uh, with your trusted healthcare uh, professional, uh, whomever that may be. Now, um, in terms of shortness of breath, uh, if you're watching this video, you're probably going to be someone dealing with it. Uh, and so just in terms of understanding uh, that, you know, I'm talking about something uh, and know what I'm talking about, just to talk about the sensation itself. Now, uh, it's a horrible, horrible sensation. It really is. And uh, what it looks like is uh, a reach for a satisfying full lung of air. And I can't get that full lung of air. And what follows is a series of attempts that um, sometimes result in being able to get that full satisfying breath and uh, sometimes uh, frustratingly uh, you cannot and that can really spiral into uh, a feeling of helplessness and uh, anxiety uh, in between a, a series of <sighs> yawns to try and compensate it. Um, it really is a, a debilitating condition and I think in uh, those short words if, if it's something that you're dealing with you'll be thinking uh, yeah, this guy knows kind of exactly uh, what I'm going through now. Um, having read over the literature over the past year, um, this thing comes up in in so many different areas and uh, it goes by a, a number of different terms. Now, uh, I just wanted to share those with you. Uh, my previous video was termed uh, pseudo dyspnea uh, or false shortness of breath. Uh, on the chat forums, people call it uh, air hunger uh, or simply call it shortness of breath uh, in some of the literature it's referred to as psi syndrome uh, and a psychogenic breathing uh, dysregulative disorder so uh, lots of terms that you can go on google uh, and go go down the rabbit hole but um, no nonetheless uh, you see another gentleman on screen his name is Steve August so uh, look I'm really privileged to have some of your time today Steve um, just uh, for the viewers, introduce yourself, uh, a little bit about your education, your location, uh, your background, uh, and what you're currently up to. Uh, right. Thank you, for, thank you very much for the invitation, Craig. Uh, this is a, a massively interesting subject. My background <clears throat> excuse me, is that I'm a, I've been a physiotherapist in Dunedin, South Island of New Zealand for about the last 30 odd years, mostly dealing with backs and necks. Um, the reason that um, I, I've been pulled into the breathing side of things is because of this condition called costochondritis, which has difficulty in breathing as one of its symptoms. The other symptom, if you haven't come across it, is um, uh, sharp chest pain, uh, can be left-sided, right-sided. Um, you often get a clicking and a popping of the rib joints on the sternum. Uh, there's um, a, a variety of other symptoms, but the, the shortness of breath is part and parcel of this costochondritis problem. And in working out what to do with the costochondritis problem, because I had it myself for seven years before fixing it, um, I, I also needed to understand about the, um, the difficulties in breathing that came with it, because they're both exactly the same basis. And so, so my interest has been in uh, costochondritis, this mysterious chest pain, which is not the heart, it's not the lungs, it's not fractures or cancers, it's not a uh, dissecting aortic aneurysm, it's not any of the dire stuff, but it's about half, possibly more, of the chest pain that presents to an emergency department. So it's really rather large. And the extraordinary thing about it is that it's understood wrongly by the doctors and often by the physios and chiropractors and what have you in the rest of the world, outside the area um, in manual hands-on physiotherapy that I work in New Zealand. Now that's a very dangerous statement to make because I could be an I am crank 
but it's actually completely supported by the existing already published peer-reviewed medical research. Yeah. Whereas what isn't supported is this general overview that this mysterious chest pain, which isn't the heart at all, is a, um, a mysterious inflammation. And it's essentially, it's not. And so treating it like that, which most of the doctors do worldwide, doesn't actually fix it. And, so and you could, I mean, you could, you, you could forgive them for treating the condition as an inflammatory condition with, with anti-inflammatories because, uh, and I'll bring it up on the screen, I mean, by definition, uh, will give us the definition of costochondritis. Yeah, well, um, so just to be clear on what costochondritis actually is, because this also explains a great deal of the breathlessness and dyspnea and the difficulties breathing, which are problems in their own right, but they're only one of the symptoms of this costochondritis problem. So what we're looking at is something that the doctors really are not good at picking up. Um, the, the mechanism of this difficulty breathing and then the if, you, if it's bad enough, the, the chest pain around the front um, is this. Basically, um, if, uh, the, there's the old model of um, breathing, um, which we used to uh, you know, describe with a, a bucket handle. Um, you know this one. As you breathe in, um, your ribs lift up. As you breathe out, the ribs drop down, um, the diaphragm's dropping and all the rest of it. Now, the ribs are hinged around the back where they, they join onto your spine and they're little hinges, they're quite solid, robust ones. Then they swing around the side of your chest and join quite delicately onto your, your breastbone, also called the sternum. And they're just like little fingers of bone, they're not very strong. Now, every breath you take, both of those hinges at the front and the back are supposed to move. If some of the hinges, and this is quite easy to do, the ones around the back, aren't moving and cannot move and are completely frozen solid, then you cannot take a full breath in. And this gets missed by doctors, um, respiratory physicians, um, medical yeah. research all over the place. And it's I, so I mean, in terms, of, in terms of my personal experience, I, I guess mm -hmm. I've seen mm -hmm. people mention costochondritis in forums before in relation to shortness of breath, but I'd been to mm -hmm. a physio, I'd been to a chiropractor uh, and presented with a shortness of breath, although um, lacked a, a diagnosis of costochondritis. And, and before I had uh, an accident in, uh, in terms of the fire where I leapt into a spa pool. Uh, before that, I had the sensation of shortness of breath, but it was not accompanied uh, by any sharp stabbing breast pain, uh, chest pain. So I thought, uh, you know, it can't be costochondritis, but it wasn't until the pinnacle event that my eyes really opened uh, because yeah. there I was dealing with both, oh, crikey, this is, that's yes. painful. Uh, <laughs> yes, it is. And I couldn't get a full breath. And that's when I found you. Yeah. So um, yeah. it, it was a leap I was unprepared to make. But now that I've made it, yeah. I can absolutely see how uh, the two go yeah. uh, hand in hand. Now, um, yeah. what you're describing, you call the eye hunch. And yeah, we'll keep, keep moving that conversation to describe what you just showed with the bucket uh, and the mechanism. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and look, absolutely. And by the way, I sympathize. Like I had costochondritis and the difficulty in breathing for seven years myself. This is before physiotherapy. Uh, in my case, I fell off a mountain. You know, um, you, you can do this quite dramatically. Leaping into a spa pool, um, you know, to, to, to reduce the pain is one of them, Craig. And what, um, I, find, what I find really interesting about that, uh, Steve, is that uh, in, a, uh, in an article published in 2008, it's an Israeli article talking about Sy syndrome, the first paper I saw on Sy syndrome. Um, they yeah. said uh, in a, a patient study of around about 40 people, uh, 13 of those people that presented presented after a trigger event uh, yep. and and so again you talk about uh, an accident or uh, something uh, and then all of a sudden yep. you're presenting with this uh, and not necessarily yep. immediately afterwards as well which is something like that. yeah yeah um look um craig this is absolutely fascinating you've pulled me into a wider understanding of how big a deal lack of um, breathing fully 
is um, worldwide. I, I had just been looking specifically at when it's bad enough for the rib joints around the front to start straining and getting painful. Um, but um, I, I, I'd sort of the, I glossed over the difficulty on breathing, which is only one of the symptoms when it's bad enough to actually cause the costochondritis pain around the front. And basically the reason the, the uh, it's, so what you do is you start off with um, tight rib joints and they can get tight for a variety of reasons. It's not that difficult to do. The, the rib joints around the back where the ribs are hinging onto your spine. I mean, if um, I turn around actually, right, right now and yeah. you probably can't see my phone, but you can see what I'm doing with my yes. with my yeah. neck. And I've been doing yes. that for 20, 25 years. I got a PC yes. and an Amiga 500 computer when I was seven years old. Ah, right. Yeah. Um, and what you were showing sideways on was... It's not bad, but it's there. Uh, a degree of thoracic hunching, where the um, uh, where your upper back is bending forwards, and um, it's it's sort of staying like that. Now, um, this is something that you can get to from trauma, leaping into spa pools, all that you know, falling off a mountain, all that side of things. But the commonest way of getting to it is what we call the eye hunch, which is um, much um, years usually of bending forward over laptops, tablets, and smartphones. So if you go sideways on again... I, I mean, and then e even a like I spent 15 years as a chef as well, and, you know, and yeah. so yeah. I'm, yeah. you know, pots, yeah. pans, I'm leaning yeah. over the whole day. Yeah. Well, here, here's, a, here's... So what happens is that for a variety of reasons, and they have accelerated in the last 10 years with laptops, tablets, and smartphones, because you cannot set them up ergonomically correctly. Like right now, I'm looking at this um, on a, uh, an iMac computer at eye level. So my, my back is actually pretty much upright. Um, however, laptops, tablets, and smartphones are different. You can't separate the screen from the keyboard unless you buy an extra screen or an extra keyboard, and then you lose the portability. So all, almost all the people using them uh, have to hunch forward to use them. I mean, the, there's no ergonomically correct way of using them. Now, they're wonderful devices. I mean, look, we're talking now and you're up in the North Island and I'm in the South Island, which mm. is fabulous. But um, it's like if you didn't put oil in your car and just kept driving it, the engine would eventually seize. It's the same with your back. If you're spending hours and hours a day, and it's often massive hours a day, and I, I know how hard work chefing is, for instance, bending forwards, then after a while, the thoracic spine starts to, to freeze like that. And when that gets tight enough, then the rib hinges joining onto the thoracic spine also freeze up. And when they can't move, then you cannot take a full breath in. So this, this makes sense of all those programs out there that uh, are setting out to teach you correct breathing and deep breathing and diaphragmatic breathing. And they're all correct. They're all good. I, I'm, I'm not criticizing any of them. But all of them miss this absolute bog standard bottom rock bottom point that you can't use your lungs correctly if you cannot shift the rib joints and and they can freeze and you cannot shift them yourself they're, That's what they're dealing with the egg and not the chicken so it's kind of like just yeah. live it. and and i yeah. guess to an extent i've learned i've developed psychological mechanisms to be able to go there's no need to panic you know, and so yep. it's less of a burden on my yep. life now than it was in March of 2020. But um, you, yep. if, if you understand what I mean. And so for someone that's watching yep. um, that's smart enough, probably the first thing they're going to do is Google costochondritis. And they're going to yep. say, well, and, and so it led on to my next question was to definitively kind of say, if you're watching this and you're dealing with a shortness of breath, but you don't have this sharp stabbing pain, uh, yep. you know, don't necessarily write that costochondritis um, may not be at you know a problem for you, and so based on your yeah. conversations so far, Steve, it kind of sounds like it, you, it sounds like a spectrum uh, almost, and at yes. the very end of the yeah. spectrum, 
I'm in pain. Uh, and yeah. my journey to get there, um, what you know, I didn't get right to that end spectrum immediately. I dealt with a year's worth of shortness of breath um, before yeah. I got to that pinnacle point. Um, uh, and, and so really interesting. Yeah. Now, when I, yeah. when I went to my uh, doctor and said, hey, I, you know, I've Googled my symptoms, pretty sure I've got costochondritis. Um, she ruled out a heart attack and any problems with my ticker. She said, yeah, well done. You've diagnosed yourself correctly. Um, here, are some yeah. ins, here are some NSAIDs or just go and buy some uh, from the pharmacy. Now, um, I, I'm yeah. guessing that's going to be the response um, most people get when they present with costochondritis at their uh, family doctor. Yeah, it is. Um, the, the, there's a very definite reason um, because the, the actual word costochondritis, the itis ending means inflammation. And I've been back through the Otago Medical School. And we've looked at all the, um, the papers on costochondritis, the medical letters and all the rest of it. And it used to be called all sorts of things um, like chest wall pain and musculoskeletal chest pain and costochondrosis and what have you. However, in the 1960s, um, the, the library was able to, to um, um, work out the stats. In the 1960s, this word costochondritis started getting used for this condition. And it rolls trippingly off your tongue and it sounds as though you know what you're talking about. And the itis ending implies that it's an inflammation. And so a busy, concerned, caring doctor in a hurry will go, oh, all right, great. It's not the heart, it's not the lungs, it's not all the major stuff. Um, it's costochondritis. I know what to do about costochondritis. Itis ending, it's an inflammation. Take these anti-inflammatories. If this doesn't work, we might end up shooting steroids into the, into the rib joints. Now, the, 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 the salient point is there is no evidential reason whatsoever for using this word costochondritis to explain the condition. Mm. But just the fact, it started being used in the 1960s and there's no evidence for it whatsoever. In fact, there's clear evidence that uh, costochondritis is not uh, a systemic inflammation uh, emphatically. That's conclusive. But this itis ending means that the docs, with the best intentions, jump in and say, right, it's an inflammation, take the anti-inflammatories, see you later. And it doesn't work. Yeah, and so look in terms of in terms of a person that uh, starts having shortness of breath and the pathway then to diagnosis. Yeah. I'm, I mean, like you just uh, mentioned earlier, in terms of an ER statistic, uh, I presented yeah. the, uh, into, into the hospital uh, thinking I was going to have a heart attack. I, I can't get a full lung of air. Something's desperately wrong. Um, and yeah. and all the tests that they performed there, uh, and from then on showed uh, clear chest X-ray, um, clear blood work, um, clear heart, clear lungs, uh, and, and and so uh, you know referred home, uh, no issues. You've had an anxiety yeah. panic attack, uh, sir. Ah, yes, yes. And um, and, and then look, what? I, 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 yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and then what? Um, I really would like to say with the anxiety thing and, and panic attacks, I think it's perfectly reasonable to be concerned about shortness of breath, let alone chest pain, that the doctors clearly don't understand and don't and certainly aren't able to fix, generally speaking. Um, I think concern about that is perfectly normal and sane and 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 the right thing. What I hate is when you then get dropped into an anxiety pigeonhole as though that's all that's going on, as though all you are is anxious because they don't understand the problem. I really but, but, yeah, that. Understandably, that's all that was left uh, without knowing yeah. about costochondritis. Yeah. And so uh, from there, I went to a breathing specialist uh, who said, you need to learn to breathe again, uh, uh, you know, yeah. the, the in for two, hole for four, out for six, and to be able to ab abort the anxiety attack, which will work, but it's the chicken and the egg situation. I still can't get a yeah. full lung of air. Uh, a chiropractor, yeah. a physio, and then back to yeah. the doctor who said, Craig, it's time to go and see a psychiatrist. I, I can recommend <sighs> yep. I can recommend three for you. Uh, I cried yep. uh, cried to my wife. I said, I, you know, I'm not. I'm not. You know, I'm okay. <laughs> no, I just, you're not. You know, uh, and, and Craig, so, I really, 
I, I really sympathize. And I've heard that story so many, many times. Exactly. I mean, people will be watching this now crying, like yeah. crying at their computers because that's them uh, yeah. in a nutshell. And uh, and it's yeah. a crying shame. And, and then to think yeah. I got right to the point of, of diagnosing myself and then the doctor yeah. said, congratulations, costochondritis, here's medication. Yeah. That's a real crying shame. Well, and so we get to the juice now I, yeah. I guess of the yeah. of the talk and and of the presentation yeah. uh, i could be on ssri uh anti-anxiety uh, medication right now but i'm not yeah. um because i was able to look past and look into costochondritis yeah. to understand yeah. the root cause yeah yeah but there'll be a lot of people who didn't get to that um and the, the other thing is um th there's a very definite objective um, driver towards anxiety and um, and even panic attacks with costochondritis. I mean, I've treated Baxanex for 30 plus years as a physio, and you see anxiety plus or minus panic attacks with costochondritis in a way that you do not see with chronic neck or low back problems. It's not the same thing at all. And it and it's basically this. There's the, the scariness that it might be a heart, but the doctors are really good at checking out heart and lung and all the dire stuff. That, that's what they're, they're superb at. And always, anybody watching this, first time chest pain, the first thing you do always is go urgently to your doctor or urgently to the emergency department, just in case it is some of the dire stuff. Cheeringly, most of it isn't, but it's still always the first port of call. Now, if you've got rib joints around the back that can't move, you cannot fill your lungs fully. And when I say can't move, they're frozen. They're like concrete when you push on them. There's no spring and give, which you get on a normal moving joint. You get good at picking these things up and they're, they're not hard to detect. <clears throat> and there's also clinical tests we can do just to see what the total range of movement mm. of the rib cage is. And I, and I, I can describe that. Um, but anyway, so you've got joints around the back that have frozen and it, it's like a rusted hinge that's been frozen up for months or years and, in, and not infrequently decades. So no movement, all the, um, the, the ligaments around them, the joint capsules, all the massively tough collagen. <clears throat> are, so the, the, the root joints are, are completely frozen and not moving at all around the back. Um, so you cannot take a full uh, breath of air into your lungs, regardless of how good the lungs are. If you can't expand the rib cage around them fully, and you cannot do that if some of the rib joints around the back can't move, it's physically impossible. There's, there's even um, medical research um, from the 1920s proving this, um, where they put people into all these corsets and tested what sort of breaths they could bring in. But it's totally common sense anyway. You can't fill your lungs fully if you can't expand the rib cage around them fully. And the hinges can be so frozen that you cannot shift them yourself. You've got to bring in an external force. Um, and that's someone like me or a chiropractor or an osteopath who can unlock the hinges, but that doesn't stretch the shortened, amazingly tough collagen around the hinges at the back, um, which will just freeze them up again. So that's why you get that cliche of going to say a chiropractor and they bang the hinges free and you go, oh great, I can get a, a, full, breath, a full breath in. But if that's all you do, you cannot stretch out the tight, shortened, amazingly tough gristle called collagen holding the hinges onto the spine. And so that just freezes it up, usually quite quickly, often days, certainly within a, a week or two. And so you get this, I think, mad cliche, not so much in New Zealand, but American chiropractors definitely, where all they're doing is banging the same hinges free indefinitely. Mm. Um, but it's not getting ahead of um, freeing the uh, the tight collagen gristle around them up so they can actually stay free. And so, and so, before we go on to <clears throat> how to resolve um, and, and loosen up the collagen, uh, in yeah. terms of then just understanding the the uh, physiology you've just described uh, and the tightening of of those uh, of that of the you know of what we're talking about, then the result is I can't get a full lung of air. Which then, exactly. I, which then I realize and go, oh crikey, I cannot get a full lung of air. Yeah, and, yeah. and try yeah. and take a full yeah. breath in. Which, yeah. which, if I do that repeatedly, results yes. in hyperventilation. Yes. And, and and that's the spiral down into yes. anxiety, 
and eventually yep. dep depression and and it yep. gets you know like it gets really bad yeah like, yeah okay yeah so. look, I, look I, you you've described it wonderfully i i really sympathize and since we i put some this explanation for costochondritis out on the the net in a a clunky, you know, cell phone video. Uh, I, I've, I've had about 10,000 contacts in the last few years from all around the world um, asking me about costochondritis. And, and of course, the breathing thing comes up. And what you've just described is what I hear so many times. It's part of the story that people have been through with yeah. costochondritis and also with the, the, the lack of breathing. Because if you can't, um, if you can't open up your rib cage fully, then you have to breathe high and fast in the top of your lungs. And that pushes you down exactly that pathway you're talking about, hyperventilation, anxiety, panic attacks, and, and depression. And it, it's, it's a horrible, horrible progression. Mm -hmm. And the, the other comment I was going to say was, look, I have never yet spoken to, um, I have to say this, um, I, I lecture to um, the GPs and other doctors in various medical conferences around New Zealand and including to the uh, emergency department um, down here in my local hospital on specifically costochondritis. And the, the, the reception has been wonderful. Um, I, I have been a little nervy about standing up and saying, look, you know, you're really not understanding this correctly, but the, the response has just been overwhelmingly great. Um, the, in, in fact, the head of the um, Dunedin um, ED, uh, lovely guy who's been there for about 30 years. So look, we, we, we're swamped with this stuff. We've been dealing with it um, daily. And this is the first time anybody's ever made sense of it for us. It's just uh, th this explanation that I'm giving is straightforward, bog standard, New Zealand hands-on manual physiotherapy. And we're good on this stuff and we're good on spines. Um, but the the, the, the general doctor diagnosis of costochondritis is this mysterious inflammation. So it's like this was purely chance on my side. I hadn't realized what a, a big deal it is as a problem worldwide uh, until we put up this initial clunky video on it and I got deluged. Um, it, in my area, it's a straightforward problem. Free up the rib hinges, stretch the collagen so they can stay free, get patients doing exercises. It, it's a bit like taking the handbrake off on the car. It's a mechanical problem and it's it's not that difficult, but it's just not seen as that. And therefore it's not referred yeah. to physios for so help at that, by the doctor. At that point where my doctor said, Craig, you know, I want you to go and see a psychiatrist. He should have been mm. saying, Craig, uh, we've checked everything, heart, lungs, blood, everything looks yeah. good. What I want you to do is go and see the local physio. And yeah, um, and yes, and um, I mean, physios also vary. Not all, not all physios. I mean, I've spent thirty years doing the hands-on stuff, and you do get physios who just give you exercises, and that actually isn't enough with this problem. You've got to get hands-on stuff, or we actually invented a, a spinal fulcrum you could use to lie back on to to stretch the tight rib hinges, but. Uh, I mean, bearing in mind, I had mine jammed up for seven years after I fell off the mountain and bashed up my, my left-hand side. And the other thing is I, I do sympathise. A, a major reason why I'm doing this is I've been through all of this myself, including the sharp stabbing chest pains, which feels like a knife going in. And it's bloody scary. Yeah. You know, um, I was scared. Um, so I do know what people who are actually... Um, tight enough around the back for the ribs around the front to start giving and straining like like spraining your ankle what they're going through and and then at least I'm in the trade I understood what was going on um and I could get it sorted out and I haven't had a twinge in 30 years and my lung capacity is completely fine um but if you're trying to make sense of it as a patient it's just a tangle of um differing things and the doctors mostly are not helping I wanted to say one thing about that from the doc's point of view, they're, they're not at all malicious or uncaring or anything yeah, like that. There, there, there just is this red herring in their understanding of it. And, and the other thing is, look, as a physio, I, as, a, as a GP, you've got to understand a spread of problems that wide. As a physio, and especially in this, I only have to know about that bit. Mm. It's easier. Mm. This is my area. Um, the, the last thing I was going to say from the doc's point of view, this doesn't show on X-ray or CAT scan or MRI scan because 
in spite of their complexity, those are just still photos. So you, you take a photo of a gate hinge, you can't tell whether it's completely free moving or frozen solid. And mm. it's the same with these. So the scans come back and the patient thinks, and I guess the doctor thinks it's even more in, in, in the patient's head because the, um, even the MRI says that everything's fine. But what it can't show is whether the hinges around the back can move. And if they can't, then that's your problem. Mm. Um, so we, we need to free those up. That's oh, the core of it. Absolutely, Steve. I mean, uh, in New Zealand, uh, a doctor's got 15 minutes to see you. And, and you know, they're seeing 30, 35 people per day. So, uh, you know, it's a big ask yeah. to have a, a high degree of specificity. And and I guess that's why I say it, the ideal recommendation would, would be a would be the awareness to be able to spot it and then refer yeah. you on through the through the um, network to a physio that was aware of costochondritis and specialised yeah. in being able to give the advice uh, to be able yeah. to resolve the eye hunch. And, and so I hope yeah. for the viewers that, that they now understand the physiological uh, mechanism to the eye hunch uh, and the reasons for it. Now, uh, if we could move on to kind of talking about and, and this is the you know the the golden nugget for people is to um, is to say you're not stuck with with stuck collagen for the rest of your life not if you don't want to be. Yeah. Um, and and yeah. so, what does yeah. that, that pathway look like? Okay. Well, basically, uh, I, I guess I should jump into this. We invented a thing called the back pod. Um, that's um, this thing here. This this isn't a. <laughs> This isn't a product placement. This is something that um, uh, I went into after my thumbs were getting sore enough after 30 years that um, I stopped treating um, patients. Now, I, I looked around and said, okay, I, I've got 30 years of experience in this area. Where can I put it? And the biggest upper spinal problem in the developed computer savvy world um, is um, the eye hunch. And this is technologically driven um, um, uh, medical problem. Uh, I, I was explaining earlier on, laptops, tablets, and smartphones, you have to hunch to use them. You cannot set them up ergonomically correctly. And so I live in the student area in Dunedin, and I see the 19-year-olds walking past my place with hunched thoracic spines looking like someone in their 70s or 80s looked when I started physio 30 years ago. And it is major. Um, so. Uh, basically, all we did, and it's it's just bog standard New Zealand physio, was analyse what goes on with lots of hunching and build a very simple home program to counter each component. Uh, that's free for anyone. All, all, all you have to do is, is Google the back pod, uh, like www.backpod, B-A-C-K-P-O-D.co.nz. Um, there's pages on costochondritis, there's pages on the eye hunch. Um, we're, we're in the process of upgrading it. So there's a free program there for anybody to use. Um, it's got videos as well as diagrams and instructions. And it's very simple because, because the problem happens always the same way from bending forwards. You can analyze it accurately from what goes wrong. And you can therefore build a very simple home program, um, in our case, including the back pod, um, to counter each component. Now, this sounds a little bit complicated, but it's really not. It's just there's all this, I'd have to say, gimmicky stuff out on Amazon and what have you, where everybody's jumping up and down saying, you know, here's a single answer, um, like there's those little braces you can use to pull yourself back and, and, and what have you. But they're all single factor answers. And actually, what it is, is a, um, a, a multi-factor problem. It's not difficult but you have to touch all the bases. You have to deal to all the little bits to pull a spine back to mm. essentially what we all had when we, when, when, when we were little kids. You watch little kids running around. They're fabulous. They're automatically, their head is balanced above their shoulders, looks great. Um, and then look at people walking around. If you want an interesting time, um, the, 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 in a perfect neck, the, the earlobe should be sitting above the, the point of your shoulder vertically. That's, that means all the elements of the spine are balanced on top of each other, um, like a flagpole going straight up, minimal loading. It's, it's what we, you know, it's what we started out as, um, it's what we should have. Well, you will now see people walking around where the back of their head is sitting in front of their chest. 
I mean, this is major. And and with young people, it's already like that. It gets worse, not better. And it, it this is an absolute tsunami. It, it's not business as usual. And the the, the breathing thing is a um, a further complication from it when the um, when the, the the rib joints around the back get tight enough as well to stop you. Um, um, expanding your rib cage fully to breathe in fully. So that's when the, the breathing comes in. But by that stage, or the breathing problems come in, but by that stage, you've already got this hunched thoracic spine. And, um, so, so it's almost uh, like the, 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 the day that you pick up this device, yeah. the day that you're born into yeah. society, is the day you enter the spectrum of costochondritis, and it's just the people yeah. that end up with the shortness of breath uh, on the way down that spectrum where they'll end up with yes. both shortness of breath and eventually sharp stabbing pains, um, uh, yes. heaven, heaven forbid, uh, and they need yep. to for a journey uh, to go back to um, back, back to where they were when they came yes. out of the womb. <laughs> yeah, and um, uh, actually well, there's a diagram we came up with for it, which we could, we could put on about this point. But Ooh. basically, look, you've, you, you've got a spine, lots of moving parts. If you're bending forward, um, then to hold, just to hold your head up, all the muscles around the, the back of your neck are working massively over time, like, like five times more work than if the, the, the spine was upright. So if you're in that cantilevered bending forward position, these muscles around the back get really strong, but uh, around the back of the neck get really strong, but really tight. At the same time, because your chin's poking out, these muscles here, they're not being used. So the chin pokes out, so they get weak. Now, what that means is that in that position, uh, you're cranking the head back and every single joint in the neck in that position is compressed. And after a while, they'll stick. Um, you'll get headaches because the, the nerves essentially are getting triggered around was, the back. I was, so just, I was just thinking about this. I mean, for those of you who have watched yeah. my videos before, um, I have cluster headache, and uh, there will people yeah. that are, will, would be absolutely enraged um, for me to say that uh, the neck is involved. No, it's the hypothalamus, and no. Well, well, the, no. the, the, <laughs> tr the truth is we, do, we don't really know. Uh, uh, there is a technique out of a gentleman um, with a pain a headache clinic uh, in Brisbane. Um, the Watson technique is what it's called and he believes yeah headache and migraine is absolutely involved uh in the brain and yep. the lower the lower brain yeah. stem or the, yeah the lower brain stem so very dean watson yeah. is his name yeah um yeah no i know I, I mean there's good um treatment in this area comes out of new zealand and australia um to be to be honest i think new zealand was leading 20 years 30 years ago but i think the australians are ahead of us now um and i'm saying that as a new zealander there's there's very good stuff comes out of there but this is this is australian um this is a, a nicholas uh, nikolai bogduck um now emeritus professor nick bogduck um describes himself as a um uh, an investigative anatomist anyway way back in the 80s um nick drafted a whole chunk of uh, a whole number of med, um, uh, medical students and medical staff and injected every structure in the back of the neck with um, irritative um, um, chemicals um, so and created a headache from the the joints at the top of the neck from the muscles that anchor onto the skull from the top disc um, all of that area there all of it would you, you put the um uh, the, the nasty stuff down the needle and you created a headache in the living person. And then he put some um, analgesic down the same needle and that took it away. And that's, it's called um, injection diagnosis. It, it's a very high level of proof. So it's not at all, um, con this shouldn't be controversial. I'm not, I'm not saying all headaches are from this, but absolutely you can, um, you can get load on the neck Absolutely, completely and controvertibly, you can get I mean, headache from Yeah, it. certainly in terms of the trigeminal neuralgias, when you understand yeah. that, you know, the trigeminal ganglions and the lower brain stem yeah. then shoots all the information uh, up into yeah. the higher brain, it's, you know, it starts to become a very, uh, very interesting uh, conversation. And of course, 
Um, the, yes. sleep, the sleep centres uh, are also located uh, in the same, same area of the brain. So, um, yeah. uh, and again, uh, that's a, a wider conversation. So, uh, look, you were mm. holding up something uh, uh, green and blue and kind of plastic before. Um, tell us about right. the, yeah, Tell us about the back pod. Look, this is the back pod. Um, all it is is a spinal fulcrum because... Um, you can unlock with hands-on manipulative techniques, manual techniques, um, frozen joints in the, say, thoracic spine and the rib joints joining onto the thoracic spine. Okay. But what you can't do in a, a single split-second clunk um, is stretch out the very, very tough collagen, um, uh, which is tightened down around those immobile hinges while they couldn't move. And collagen is what holds your spine together. Muscles only just move it around. So collagen is stronger kilo for kilo than steel wire. It's massively, massively tough stuff. And you can stretch it, but you need a sustained stretch, um, at least a minute usually, um, and uh, an accurate one with enough force. Um, so basically, uh, in practical terms, uh, I think the only way of getting a long enough, strong enough, sustained enough stretch on the, the, the shortened, tough collagen around the tight rib and spinal hinges is by using a spinal fulcrum where um, the patient's basically lying back on it. Um, so it's using their upper body weight to, to push on the little device. And therefore they're getting a serious, um, um, and, and in, in the case of the back pod, um, quite accurate little stretch off the, the, the very top um, um, uh, spot there and a tighter stretch if you turn it sideways on, um, on specifically the rib joints, if we're talking about breathing. Um, th there's various other things that are around and, and they're useful, uh, but uh, a thoracic um, a, a roller, for instance, is a long cylindrical shape and they're useful for um, lying back on, but um, you can't get the rib joints because it's the, the cylindrical shape of the roller spreads your upper um, body weight over the length of the, of the cylinder. And therefore you just can't get much leverage on specific bits and especially on specific rib joints. Whereas the, um, that we deliberately made the, the small peaked shape of the, of the back pod so we could get it in between the spine and the inside of the shoulder blade so we can work it up and down the ribs. And I think it's about the only thing around that will actually do an effective stretch on the ribs. Um, th this is polycarbonate. It's the, the same sort of thing they use in jet fighter windshields like the F-22 Raptor. We, we drove a, 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 it's massively strong. So that, that lets us get, and the, the, the green is a, 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 a artificial rubber cushioning. So it lets us get enough leverage in to actually make a difference. So, so um, if, literally two parts to it, that's it. Yeah. I, I mean, um, if you were so in no it, if you're in it to make a dollar, you would have included USB chargers, a whole lot, a whole lot of stuff, right? But it's, so it's a simple, uh, lightweight con contraption. Great, C completely simple. Um, we we drove a um, a BMW over one to test it for Europe, and a Jeep Cherokee to test it for America. And it, you know, it, it was it was fine. Um, but uh, so all it is is just um, an aid. Um, I, I mean, it's basically it's a tool for stretching tight rib joints around the back and also tight hunched thoracic spinal joints. Um, I, I do think it's the best one available. I mean, we, we built it after 30 years of physio. It's, 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 it's not just thrown together. It's not just a geometric shape. Yeah, um, so, look, so, certainly when you've got your own problem to fix, it is amazing what the humans yes. can do, you know. Uh, I would say that yeah. having, having journeyed with cluster headache and vitamin D3, you know, I would not have found it yeah. um, if, I, if I wasn't faced with, with the pain. So uh, people can see the photos um, of, of yeah. the back pod being used on screen, but uh, what they won't be able to see is... Um, you know, do I need to spend an hour on this thing in the morning? I'm a busy guy. Right. Well, it, it's it's really not that big a deal. It's, it's exactly the same as stretching a tight hamstring. If you imagine you you couldn't touch your, your knees because your hamstrings are so tight, it's not instant. It's going to take you a few weeks of daily stretching 
to, before you can get down and touch your toes. Um, but it, it's exactly the same thing. It's just stretching the collagen until it's free enough to stay free. So usually, ideally, most people come onto it because they've got a problem because they're sore and therefore, um, and because they're sore, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're tight. And they can be, I mean, we can talk about a, a, a great deal of tightness. In, in my case, the ribs had been frozen up for seven years before I actually worked out what was going on after I became a physio and then um, and, and worked out what to do about it. And you're quite right. There's nothing like having the problem yourself to give you a serious interest in, in finding out how to fix the damn thing. Um, so um, the... Um, uh, in terms of timing, um, generally stay for about half a minute or a minute in each position, but move it up and down the spine. So you, you, you're getting the different areas up and down the spine, thoracic spine, um, and also then out to the sides, um, as I say, between the um, spine itself and the inside edge of the scapula. So it's only about 30, 40, 50 mils, depending how big you are, out from the midline of the spine, and you move it up and down there as well. So you, you're looking at five, 10 minutes, ideally once a day for the first two or three weeks, maybe. But then, I mean, I, I still use mine from time to time, like um, once every few weeks if I've been doing a whole lot of computing um, and I can feel it just starting to get tight again. So I just loosen it off again. So it, that was, main, maintenance is easy. That was my very next question. I caught up with a friend a couple of weeks back. Uh, he had said, uh, I said, how's it going? He said, oh, I've been to the doctor, chest pains, but he reckons I've, you know, just sprained it. It's not, nothing to do with my heart. I said, Great. buy Good. the back pod. I made him buy yep. it then and there. <laughs> So I, I saw him last right. week. He, he'd had the back pod for eight days. So I said, how's it going? He said, oh, I'm fixed. Mm. I said, are you still using it? He said, he said right. yeah, I'm fixed. I said, that's yeah. crazy. It took you 40 years to get to this position of needing to yeah. buy this device. Yeah. Why would you not just yeah. do it for like 10 minutes yeah. while you're mm. waiting for your jug to boil in the morning, you know, while you're yeah. waiting for your coffee type thing? Yeah. No, there's a really technical answer. The, the collagen we're talking about, um, you can stretch it. It's a, it's a lapse rate curve. And technically, you, you get most of it in the first month, say, first few weeks. Um, but technically, it'll keep trying to tighten up again for up to six months. You know, less and less and less. But um, that's why, actually, you're dead right. Um, it, it's obviously worked. That's fabulous. Um, so it's freed off the rependers. So that's at the back. So that's taken the pressure off the ones at the front. Um, and I, I, I appreciate the genuine customer report here, Craig. Um, but you know, generally, this isn't. <laughs> this is a, this is totally unsolicited. But generally, this isn't a, a difficult problem. I mean, that's the whole thing with all of this. From my point of view, as a as a manual physio, this isn't difficult. Yeah, I loved. I used to love getting these patients coming in through the door because they were so much easier than a standard back or a neck problem. It's just a matter of knowing what to do for it. Yeah. So, um, in terms of my friend's uh, case, it was a you know a week, and my encouragement was for him to keep going. But you know, in my mm. personal case, it took a, a long time uh, of short yeah. of dealing with shortness of breath to be able to then find out that it was related to this. Um, uh, you know, out of interest, I, I one of my hobbies is to uh, grow shiitake and different kinds of culinary mushrooms. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so I follow a number of mushroom groups and uh, one member had joined uh, looking to uh, procure uh, psychedelic mushrooms uh, for the purposes of microdosing uh, to be able to deal with the sensation of not being able to satisfy a full breath, you know, and it's just really? absolutely amazing yeah. that the different pathways people will find themselves yeah. following. Yeah. And in, in yeah. search for a truth um, that they've been been unable to obtain yeah. uh, at no fault well, really of their family doctor, but but man, what a shame! Yeah. Uh, what a shame! Uh, yes, and, and the reason Look, I, you know we're making this video. Yeah. Uh, in terms yeah. of um, safety uh, of using uh, uh, the back pod, you know, as I say, there's not much to it. But um, is there any considerations one should have? before they buy it and use it? 
honestly very very little i mean anybody um is welcome to go on to um the, web, the website just google the word backpod and um you'll you'll get us especially backpod new zealand for the new zealand website and there's a um uh, there's a warnings and instruction uh sorry warnings and precautions and and contraindications there as part of the the user right. guide there's a full user guide there as a pdf but really it's it, it's it's a uh, it's a lump. It's a cushioned lump. Um, it's smooth. You you can't fit it up any orifice. Um, it's um, uh, it's not going to break. Uh, the 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 thing is massively tough. It's totally under um, the user's control. They can roll off it if there's any problems. Um, the, things like osteoporosis. If your bones are significantly weak, then yes, you should talk to your doctor first and ask. But even then, I mean, we've had people in their 80s um, do really well on the back pod and say, look, this is great and I can breathe better and I can sit straighter. It takes a while and you do it gently. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it's only a stretch. It's, it's not like a manipulation where there's a, a clunk and, a, and like hitting it with a hammer. Um, it, it's, it's only um, a benign stretch and you, you grade it with pillows under your head and if necessary, uh, you know, a roll a, you know, fluffy tail on the back pod. So it's only an uncomfortable stretch. I, I've got to say the one problem we have had with it, um, and I, I've got to say very largely young US males, uh, are people not reading the instructions, hurling themselves on the back pod going ah it's too sore it's too hard i can't use it um um you know it's it doesn't work and basically if if you you know when i said it's stretching the tight stuff uh, in this case on the back pod is like stretching a tight hamstring now if your hamstrings were so tight you couldn't touch your knees if you try and force down to the floor in one hit it will hurt every time if you try and stretch anything that's too tight too much in one hit it will hurt every time. If I if I pull my finger back another 50 mil or so, two inches, it'll hurt every time. So um, all you have to do uh, with the back pod, you're starting to stretch joints, which may not have moved for years. And if you try and do it too hard to start with, it'll hurt. So you don't do that. All you do is start off with, it's in the instructions, with pillows under your head. So you're getting an uncomfortable stretch You've, you've got to feel something or it wouldn't be doing anything, just like stretching a hamstring. But you just have to accept that it's not instant and that it's going to take a few weeks and it gradually gets freer and freer and freer, exactly as, you, as you'd expect. And as, so, as, as the penny drops for people uh, and they, um, you know, they're on, you know, they go on and get themselves a back pod uh, or whatever, uh, in terms of going to see a, a physio or a chiropractor or an osteopath uh, in their part yeah. of the world, is that um, something that someone could do alongside <sighs> the back pod? Definitely, yes. And, and the ideal would be um, go to a good physio or chiro or osteopath. Um, they can unlock the, the hinges. They can unlock the thoracic hinges with manipulation. By the way, that's all manipulation is. It's like cracking your knuckles. It's um, it's momentarily um, freeing the joint, um, uh, the joint surfaces. So you get that little cracky pop. It's absolutely not putting anything back in anywhere. That's just a nonsense phrase meaning nothing. Um, so yes, do that, and then get them on the back pod and get them to um, to loosen the um, the tight. Uh, gristle around the hinges which have been unlocked that's the perfect combination but I, I've got to say it's been a learning curve um, for me so manipulation is great for unlocking hinges but it doesn't stretch them out so they can stay free and the back pod actually will often usually um, stretch everything free just using the back pod but in some cases it's tight enough and it's certainly quicker if you get someone to unlock the hinges first and then stretch it the rest of the way with the back pod. That, yeah, that's I mean, the ideal. Understandably, as Steve, some people will, will have waited years to perhaps see this, uh, so they'll want to go full hog uh, into yes. it, you know, uh, and, yeah. and com I completely understand that. Uh, yeah, yes, so. for sure. Uh, no. um, well, yeah, yeah. I, I was going to say, look, I, I, it's been a learning curve for me because, I, I, as I say, over the last few years I've had this amazing amount of input. Um, and um, so I have learned a few things. 
there, there's an approach in physio, and I am a physio, which says you can fix everything um, just by exercises. Well, with this sort of stuff, you can't. You, you've got to have specific hands-on force, whether it's coming from the physio hands-on um, or from something like the back pod um, to, to stretch out the, the tight stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm an example, um, and so are you. Um, I, I, for seven years, I had the chest pain, the, the rib joints around the back were completely frozen up. And that's in spite of yoga, swimming, scuba, karate, tramping, uh, trampolining, all, all this sort of stuff. None of my own exercises had enough leverage to free the specifically tight rib joints. And that's, that's my experience as a physio. So you've got to get in. So if you go to a physio um, and they just give you exercises for this stuff, um, it's probably going to make it worse, not better, because um, all you're doing is straining the, the tight bits, but you haven't got enough leverage to free them. And specifically, if it's costochondritis, you've already got strain happening on the, the, the rib hinges on the front. Any general exercise you do is going to strain those more, like running on a sprained ankle, way before you get to an improvement on the tight stuff around the back. I so didn't you, even, you I didn't even think it. about that. And that's so true for yeah. my, my visit to that. Yeah. Oh, actually, yeah. come to think of it, both times, I feel like I said I'll never go back, that I just feel worse. Yeah. Really, yeah. really interesting, isn't it? Wow. Well, f f physios vary, doctors vary, hairdressers vary, um, chefs vary. Um, um, uh, I, you know, I hate to say, it, you have to think for yourself with this stuff. And what we've just described is just such common sense. Um, so, so that's why the specificity is so useful. The other thing I was going to say um, that I've had so much feedback about is traditional American chiropractors. And I, I've got to say, I'm a bit appalled. Um, I mean, I'm not doing a physio versus chiro thing in the slightest. Um, used to work in with the chiros around here. And I've been taught osteopathic techniques as well as um, chiro manipulation, as well as the there's a whole eclectic range of physio manipulation. Um, so it's, it's anything that helps the patient I'm vastly in favor of. But I've got to say, um, in, in, in America, not all of them, but so many of the chiros appear to just get the same patient in again, bang, 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 um, you know, once a week for the rest of their lives. And all they're doing is bashing the same hinges free. They're not stretching them so they can stay free. So, I mean, the, the patient keeps coming back to them. And the other thing is they've got a bias assuming that everything's coming from the spine. So they're usually manipulating the spine but they're not usually manipulating the rib joints, which join onto the spine, which are the core of the breathing problem and the costochondritis problem. So this is uh, this is from much, much feedback. Um, I, I'm really not trying to be disparaging, but as a fair overview for the patient who's trying to make sense of it, that's absolutely been my experience. Yeah, and yeah. The osteopaths yeah, tend yeah. to be good. In terms of uh, uh, getting a diagnosis or partway through uh, a diagnosis, um, there, there are several things that people can do, um, and we can provide a link to that document. I believe it's on the Body Stance website. Yes, um, uh, there, there, there's a lot of good stuff on the Body Stance website. Um, so uh, it's the same thing, www.bodystance.co.nz um, or www.backpod.com dot co dot nz it'll it'll get to our new zealand website um and i'm i'm frantically trying to write all sorts of extra stuff and put it up on there as well um, but we're trying to make it explanatory and useful for people um, now, uh, you know ever since i posted my video um which has had in a year i think twenty thousand views now um oh. of people in the same position uh, I've had gentlemen from uh, people from Albania, for heaven's sake, reach out. Yeah. Um, yes. And, and, yes. And so, in terms of backpod distribution, uh, where is it available around the world? Um, we're getting towards most countries now. Um, look, I, I, I mean, I'm the the physio side. Um, uh, I've got a couple of partners 
who are, are much more about the production and, and dissemination. We can leave a link because, I mean, again, team, if you're watching, this isn't a hard sell. I, I guess it comes from I'm not getting a cent for if you go and buy the back bottle. I can assure you of that. You, I, just, I do it from um, my heart to, to uh, bring the awareness up. So um, please understand. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, look, to be honest, it, it it's looks, been... Steve, Steve lives in Dunedin, mate. He doesn't need any, any money at all. He's, <laughs> he's absolutely blessed. Well... Craig, it's been absolutely nuts. Um, we, we've sold over a hundred thousand back pods. We, we so far we got the um, we got a container load order for America just recently. Um, it's just sort of going like that. Um, and I, I, what I'm a bit flabbergasted about is this is just bog standard New Zealand New Zealand hands on physio. Like I'm, I'm a good physio, but it's it's not earth shattering. Yeah. But it just there didn't yeah. seem to be anything else out there that really made sense of what was going on and that, yeah, that's would, what we're wrong it would be my hope through uh, our conversation that um uh, that you know we increase the awareness um you, you know i think i mentioned to you there have been two uh, articles that i'm aware of um that have have picked up on the increase in uh, psi syndrome during the covid 19 mm -hmm. pandemic uh, yes. One of them was yep. Yep. looking at chinese children uh, and adolescents and and the conclusion of course uh, they draw is that you know the conclusion stated in the article reads uh, the mental health status of children and adolescents changed significantly uh, after the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, we should pay attention mm. to the psychological problems caused by returning mm. to school after the pandemic has eased and so you know there's a study yeah. correlating uh, anxiety with shortness of breath but you know I yes. I tell you what, it's a conversation of interest to think, well, uh, during the pandemic with people uh, inside, uh, hunched yeah. over devices, uh, not doing yeah. a lot, um, that yeah. may may be a correlation worth looking at uh, in terms of yeah. the prevalence of Psy syndrome. Um, but, yeah. but certainly it's among uh, one of the uh, yeah. more prevalent than I think you realised. Uh, and, and yeah. That I think I realise, uh, and yeah. so I think um, we can both know that we're doing humanity a good service. Uh, I think so. Yeah, yes. and, and we're not selling yeah. snake oil here. It's it's simply uh, presenting some literature. And so uh, I hope if you've been watching this, that you've taken something away. And uh, I know on behalf of Stephen myself, uh, absolutely wish you. Uh, the best uh, in getting a resolve with your journey. Yeah. Um, if you're a, a, a treating physician or medical professional that wants to learn more, um, Steve, is there any resource um, for that type of person um, should they wish to you know, enrich their understanding of Costo? Yes. Um, they'll get a fairly good overview from the Costo Gondritis page on the Backpod, our Backpod website. But what I'm... Um, fairly swamped with at the moment is I'm trying to write what is effectively a digital um, um, accessible textbook on costochondritis um, a, as a, a resource for anyone to access, not just patients, but also doctors, uh, emerg emergency departments, surgeons, um, chiropractors, uh, osteopaths, physios. Um, I, I think when it's done, so it'll be around right about a hundred odd um, FAQs and topics all searchable and we're going to link it and we can put in all sorts of videos um, and the pdfs um, so i'm hoping it will be i think it will be uh, essentially the world go-to resource site on costochondritis that's really not me doing a big i am um, I'm, I'm a good new zealand physio and i've been pulled into this and i've got a good understanding of it it's just that that just is not out there and the um uh, and so although I'm talking about costochondritis, the difficulty breathing is part of the is part of costochondritis. So we're, we're still talking about dyspnea and lack of breathing fully. So I'm um, it's it's turning into quite a major exercise. I hadn't realized just quite how much work it was going to take, but it'll be free for everyone. Um, anyone can access the back pod absolutely gets a mention and validly so because there just isn't anything else out there that does a really effective stretch on the tight rib hinges mm. and freeing those up is the core, irreducible core 
of, of freeing the rib cage so you can breathe in fully and taking the pressure off the ribs at the back so the, uh, the strain comes off the ones at the front. Yeah. So um, but that, that's, that's the first, first comment fair. I gave to my wife when I started using it. I said, there's no way that anyone could uh, apply this pressure. If they did, their finger would be like really, really sore. Yeah. But yeah. Um, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Steve, uh, thank you for, I appreciate your time. Like, uh, really do. Uh, all the best to you. And uh, perhaps we can do a follow up interview where we uh, review the literature and introduce and the site in the future but until then uh, have a great christmas uh, and if you're watching uh, give us a like uh, encourage your comments and uh, visit the links which are posted in the description uh, and subscribe to the channel all the best craig thank you very much thank you so much for the invitation i'm impressed with how much you understand about this and you had a, a breadth of understanding about the disney stuff the, the breathing side of things which i'd glossed over a bit in focusing on the on the chest side it's just enormous. And yeah, this is worthwhile doing. It's been really nice talking to you. Awesome. <laughs>